In the scholarly world, it's common knowledge that civilizations throughout ancient times have influenced each other in various ways. Humans have been exchanging ideas for quite some time as they've encountered each other through trade and other cultural mediums. Today, I wanted to explore an interesting theory presented by one scholar concerning the relationship between Kush and India. What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. On Patreon, you can find more in-depth courses on African history. And with a word from my sponsors, there's a new social media platform dedicated to educating and uplifting our people. No longer do we have to be censored for speaking our truth. OBT Social is black owned and operated and a place where you can post your businesses and even monetize your content. You can visit the website at obtsocial.com. Links to everything in the description box below. To begin, this video is going to be based on a journal article by Dr. Randy Hayland. I think this scholar presents some very interesting information concerning the possible relationship between ancient Kush and India. Mostly, everything presented in this video will be based on her theory and should be understood in that context only. We need much more information concerning this topic, and so nothing in this video can be conclusive. But I thought I would present this information to the diaspora because it may spark great conversations about African history and its place in the greater narrative of world history. So let's begin. As mentioned before, all civilizations, for the most part, borrowed ideas from regions outside of their domain. Sometimes we neglect how powerful trade relationships were before the modern era. Whole economies in ancient and medieval times were very reliant on trade. To this day, it remains very important. And so, with this trade relationship comes the exchange of ideas and peoples. Aside from objects being traded, the hiring of skilled individuals by elite groups within a given society also acted as agents of influence on said society. Randy tells us that the movements of mobile craftsmen seem to have played a major role in the diffusion of ideas in ancient civilizations. We hear about these cultural exchanges in the Mediterranean and the Middle East or even in Asian societies, but sometimes the African continent, especially below the Sahara, is left out. This is one of the reasons why the dark continent trope still remains an issue in popular culture today, because we seldom hear about how Africans were connected with the rest of the world. For example, the Assyrians in their prime were a pretty dominant group, militarily speaking. However, we rarely hear about how Africans greatly contributed to Assyrian equestrian technology through the hiring of African experts. Several documents mention Kushite horse experts living in Assyria. Daly cites a Neo-Assyrian text mentioning a Kushite holding the high military office of chariot driver of the prefect of the land. According to Lisa Hydorn, the Assyrian innovation in the form of chariotry were influenced by Kushite and Sumerian experts. This is just a minor example of how interconnected the ancient world was and how Africans were very much a part of that. One of the key components of any civilization is contact with others, and oftentimes with this contact comes the growth and development of ideas. One of the earliest Kushite kingdoms was Kerma. Kerma is believed to have been established around 2400 BC or perhaps earlier. Egypt was able to take control of Kerma around 1400 BC, and even though the Nubians and the Egyptians shared a very similar Nile Valley culture, the Kerma region began to adopt a more Egyptian-centric element. During the 4th century, the Kushite center was moved from Napata to Meroe and it became the last great center of Kushite civilization. Upon this move to Meroe, the Kushites began to be more connected with the global economy, having clear contact with Greece and Rome. In the ancient world, Meroe was known for exporting ivory, gold, ebony, rhinoceros horns, leopard skins, ostrich feathers, and enslaved people. Trade was crucial to the kingdom of Meroe. The Kushite distribution of trade goods reveals just how interconnected they were with the Mediterranean world. 
However, their connection with the Indian subcontinent is not really well known. But we do know that African ivory was especially popular in India because of its higher quality. And so, contact with Africa and India, in a sense, is observable. The relationship between Kush and India showed itself in the goals of the Kushite elite. The elite demand for luxury consumer items was a major factor in stimulating the import of goods that served to express their position in local as well as in international arenas. Control over trade routes was an important part of the political economy of the Meroitic state. The imported trade goods consisted of luxury goods. This type of trade formed an important part of a wider prestige goods economy where exotic artifacts were controlled by the ruler and redistributed through various channels to the elite. The Kushite elite seemed interested in obtaining foreign objects and even adopting some foreign concepts to not only set themselves apart, but to affirm their place as rightful ruler. The Kushites may have begun this because of what was going on in the world at the time. During this time, traditional legitimating ideologies were challenged in all major empires of the ancient Afro-Asian world. Egyptian political and ideological influence had been weakened by the Ptolemaic conquest and seaward trade over the Indian Ocean increased. These dramatic global changes in trade, power, and ideology had, I suggest, a significant impact on the symbolic expression of legitimating ideology that took place in the late Meroitic Kingdom. I think this is a novel concept, but hopefully we may find more conclusive evidence for this. Randy Halen believes that it's in this context that the Kushite elite allowed more Indian cultural aspects to be introduced into Kushite iconography and symbolism. One of the ways the Kushites showed a possible relationship with India is how they artistically represented the god Apidemic. The most interesting scene is on the outside of the back wall where Apidemic is uniquely represented as a three-headed god with four arms a common attribute of Indian gods. The manner in which Apidemic is holding his hands and displaying his fingers appears similar to Indian iconography, with hand positions in the Mudra convention prominent within Hindu as well as Buddhist tradition. Another representation of Apidemic is from the same temple where the god is seen as emerging from what Shiny and Wodung notice as a lotus flower in the shape of the body of a snake, iconography that is also reminiscent of Hindu and Buddhist traditions. In terms of the site of Naka, there were features that show epidemic was influenced by Indian culture. However, at the site of Musawarit as Sufra, we do not find that epidemic reflects Indian influence. Instead, there are several other cultural features indicative of Indian influences such as a column drum showing a number of gods depicted in an unusual high relief, and one engraved figure in a yoga-like position. I find these observations to be fascinating, because before I read this article and was privy to this research, I was always reminded of the Hindu religion when I laid eyes upon the god Apidemic being portrayed in that way. So according to this theory, how did these artistic and symbolic ideas reach Kush? Well, migrants, travelers, or hired experts did not just bring with them their knowledge, but they also were agents in disseminating aspects of their culture. It is not unlikely that ideas related to the symbolic world of India were transmitted to rituals in Meroe by experts, and that the Indian Mahouts were the carriers of these ideas. Some representations of elephants also denote some Indian contact according to Randy's theory. If her theory is correct, once again, it shows just how interconnected Africa was with the rest of the world and how important it is to include Africa in discussions about ancient world history. Well, I'm all out guys. Let me know in the comment section below if you find this theory to be interesting and if it holds any weight in the discussion on the relationship between Africa and India. And if you like these videos and want to show your support, you may do so on patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself.
Remember your ancestors. Peace.